I thank you for that good song. That was a blessing, wasn't it? Good stuff. I'm glad you're here tonight, and uh, what a blessing, amen, to be in the Lord's house on a Monday night, amen, and uh, had great services yesterday and had good fellowship today with Pastor, and, and uh, looking forward to a good time in, in the Lord tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter number 14, and uh, get Judges chapter 14 in one hand, and that's where we're going to kind of be in the book of Judges, but I want you to take your Bibles and turn back to 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. I mentioned my mom and dad yesterday, and they're both in heaven now. And My dad led me to the Lord when I was 15 years old, and, and my dad was a great uh, man of God and a great soul winner. And, and, of course, when I was a little boy, he was a state trooper. And that last Sunday in August 1966, when my mom and dad walked the aisle there at the church and gave their hearts and lives to, to Jesus Christ, it certainly changed our family. And, and um, I'm so thankful that my mom and dad listened to God, okay? They listened to God. And it was there at that church, the Wiesach Avenue Baptist Church in San Antonio, Texas, uh, that I began to go to Sunday school. And uh, I, had a, a, I was real shy and real timid. I had a first grade Sunday school teacher, and her name was uh, uh, Mrs. Griffin Jones. And Miss Jones was my Sunday school teacher, and she was a very, very good Sunday school teacher. And back in those days, uh, Sunday school teachers taught the Bible with an open Bible, and they had a flannel graph, and they would put the pictures up on a flannel graph board, and, and uh, you know, every Sunday we had memory verses, and so uh, each week they would give us our memory verse for the next week, and each Sunday we would come in, we'd have our offering envelope, and I wanted to give something in every category as a little boy. You know, I'd give something to the tithes, and then missions, and then the building, and then other, and <laughs> special, whatever's on there. I might have been a nickel in every category, but I wanted to give something in every category. And, uh, you know, I learned how to give as a little boy. But I remember my first grade Sunday school, and I was very clingy to my mother. I was very shy, very timid, and real scared. Never been away from my mom and dad much. And so I was just, uh, to go to Sunday school at a big church, you know. But my Sunday school teacher, she loved me. Oh, she loved me. And me and her had the same birthday. July 21st. You might want to write that down. July 21st. And uh, so anyway, we had the same birthday. And I remember uh, on my seventh birthday, she bought me a set of Mexican bullhorns. Whoa. Now I'm telling you, you're talking about a blessing. I mean, that was awesome, Pastor, to have my very own set. I mean, I'm seven years old, and these were like big bullhorns, you know, and I had them sitting on my dresser, and I just thought that was the most amazing thing as a little boy to have my own bullhorn sitting on my dresser, you know. And on my next birthday, she bought me a Mexican bullwhip. It was black and white, and it was braided, and I learned how to pop that thing. And oh, listen, I got in trouble. I mean, I could make my brother who was five years older than me, I popped him and could make him cry, and I mean, I got in bad trouble. It was bad. They had to take the whip away from me, amen, because I was like a little holy terror, amen. But, uh, you know, my first grade Sunday school teacher, you know, uh, and my mom, they just loved me. And, and again, I was a little uh, shy and timid. I was a little bedwetter. We got any bedwetter? No, never mind. Uh, I was a little bedwetter, and I had the issues and, and all that stuff. But, you know, my mom and my Sunday school teacher, they just loved me, amen. They just loved me. And I remember as a little boy, my little heart was very impressionable, and I was just, um, I was learning a lot about the Lord. Are y'all listening to me? I was learning a lot. And you know, I appreciate the big people that loved me when I was a little people. And you know, it's better for a millstone to be tied about your neck than you offend one of the little ones around the church. Amen. And, and uh, some of the little kids yesterday, some of the, you know, like bus type kids, you know what I'm saying? A lot of those little kids, they need to be loved. And, and coming to church might be the only true love a lot of them get, you know, in, during the week. And, and a lot of them have adult-sized problems as little children, and we need to love them, okay? And I appreciate the church yesterday just watching y'all love the little kids that were here, and that was a blessing to my heart, amen? And Well, anyway, as a little boy, my Sunday school teacher challenged us, and I wasn't very smart, and, I, you know, I was kind of, I mean, I had issues. I had lots of issues. But my mom worked with me, and, and my Sunday school teacher challenged us, and she said, Boys and girls, if you'll learn the books of the Bible, we're going to go to the San Antonio Zoo. And at the San Antonio Zoo, it's a big zoo, big city, and big zoo. And, and she said they have this place in the middle of the zoo. It's called Monkey Island. And in my little six-year-old mind, I was talking, wow, this is going to be awesome. I want to go to Monkey Island. I want to go see the monkeys. You know, I just I don't even know what it was. But my mama began to work with me and work with me. And as a little shy, timid, bedwetter, 
At six years old, I learned the books of the Bible so I could go to the San Antonio Zoo. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And I know the books of the New Testament, I know it several ways. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, 2, Corinthians. I know it like a song, and, and I, I know it both ways. And, you know, as a little boy, I was, man, I was learning everything. I learned this little pledge, and it went something like this. It's called a loyal temperance allegiance, and it said this, I promise God helping me not to buy, drink, sell, or give alcoholic liquors while I live. From all tobacco I'll abstain and never take God's name in vain. Boy, that was a good little pledge, wasn't it? Man, I learned that when I was a little boy. I remember learning that song about the 12 disciples, and I can quote, uh, sing it, but I'll quote it to you. It says, There were 12 disciples Jesus called to help him, Simon Peter Andrew, James' brother John, Philip Thomas Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus Simon Judas, and Bartholomew. And you know, again, I just thank God for the people that invested in me when I was a little boy, not knowing one day that I would grow up and become a pastor and, and be able to minister. They didn't know that. They didn't know what God was going to do with my life. I didn't know what God was going to do with my life. I had to tear my script up because I wanted to be a dairy farmer and God had other plans for my life. But you know, you just don't know if the Lord tarries His coming, what's going to happen to these boys and girls, amen? So we're investing in their lives. Amen? We're investing in their lives. And America needs Christians. My generation needs me. Your generation needs you. And we certainly need to raise our boys and girls in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Wow, I love Sunday school. Sunday school is important, by the way. You can study it in the Bible, but there's a lot of references that talk about the teaching of the Word of God and then the preaching. The teaching and then preaching the Word of God. They go together. And uh, what a blessing. Now, how many of you remember... When you were a little boy or a little girl in Sunday school, you might have heard that song, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. How many of y'all remember that little Sunday school song? Okay, all right, some of you do and, and some of you don't. Now, let me just teach the boys and girls a little poem here, but y'all can all say it with me, okay? A little poem, just so y'all know I'm a big-time preacher. Pastor brought in a big-time preacher. All right, let me teach you a little poem. Y'all ready? This is not a spiritual poem, but it's just a little poem I like, okay? Y'all ready? If I influx my voice and my voice goes up, y'all go up with me, okay? Are y'all with me? All right, here we go. It goes like this. Had a little pig. Oh, we can do better than that. Come on, y'all. Help me out here. That was weak. All right. Had a little pig. Fed him in the trough. He got, so he got so fat, his tail popped off. Tail popped off. Good, you got to go up now. His tail popped off. Tail popped off. Good, I got me a hammer. And I got me some nails. And I made that pig a wooden tail. Good, all right, class, y'all are good. Okay, that was a blessing. All right, so what does that have to do with? Nothing, that's just a little poem I learned. I wanted <laughs> little poem I wanted to, to learn you, okay? Now, you know that little song, Oh, Be Careful, Little Eyes, What You See? You know, uh, it, it, as simple as it sounds, but it gives incredibly, incredibly powerful advice. Incredibly powerful advice. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Okay? I was not going to preach this message, to be honest with you, when I left home. This is not one of the messages, but it seemed like the Lord was changing my message today for some reason, and I'm just trying to go with what I feel like the Lord wants me to go with. Are y'all okay? You know what I'm saying? First uh, John chapter 2, let's look at that real quick. First John chapter 2 and verse 16. First John chapter 2, verse 16. The Bible says, for all... 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... Then notice this little statement here, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Notice that, the lust of the eyes, okay? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, 
but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, we love you tonight. We sure do. And Lord, I thank you again, Lord, for my Sunday school teachers and my pastors, Lord, in my life as a little boy that loved me. And Lord, they, uh, they helped guide my life and mold my life and shape my life into what I am today. And Lord, my life is a, is a, is, is a, 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 a compilation, Lord, of, of all these different people who invested in my life, Lord. And I thank you for them. Many of them are in heaven now, Lord. But I thank you for their investment in my life as, as a child growing up. And Lord, please bless all the Sunday school teachers and those who work with children here, the parents and grandparents. And Lord, help us to use our influence for good and for God to help shape another generation of boys and girls that love Jesus. Bless this message to our hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to look in um, Judges now, Judges chapter number 14. And in the book of Judges, we have the story of Samson. And most of you would know that Samson was the strongest man that ever lived, okay? And the Spirit of the Lord would come upon Samson and he would do some unbelievable things for God. But Samson had a lot of problems, he had a lot of pride. And he had problems. He had a lot of problems, okay? If you study his life, and uh, God used him to, uh, you know, to fight the enemy, the Philistines, and all of that. But again, um, God tries to use, or, or the devil tries to use devices to defeat us as God's children. One of the most powerful temptations uh, comes from us wanting to see things. We want to see what's going on, you know, and, and that can get us in trouble. And I want you to look in Judges chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, And Samson went down to Timnath, watch this now, and saw, you might want to mark that little word right there, uh, and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. He saw her. Everybody do this with me, okay? He saw her. Say this, but he saw her. Okay, he saw her, okay? So Samson went down to Timnath, and he saw her. Her, okay? Now look at verse number two. And he came up and told his father and mother and said, Here it is again, I have seen, I have seen, do it with me again here, I have seen, okay, I have seen a woman, a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Wow. Get her for me to wife. Well, the Bible kind of gives a double emphasis here so we can see a valuable lesson, okay? And that's what I want to kind of talk to you a little bit tonight about. Uh, First of all, Samson's eyes will rule his life. His eyes will rule his life. That's a very dangerous thing when we allow our eyes to rule our lives, okay? And not only would Samson's eyes rule his life, but Samson's eyes would ruin his life. The things that he looked at ruined his life, okay? They not only ruled his life, but they ruined his life. And that's not how we as God's children, we cannot allow our eyes to dictate what we do. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes. Everybody do this with me. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Do it, say it with me, okay? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. The song says, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, okay? Very, very powerful truth here. And we could say this uh, without apology, that Samson has a serious eye trouble. He really does. He has a serious eye trouble. And it was a very common problem in Samson's day. He wasn't the only one who had eye trouble. Take your Bibles and hold on to Judges 14, 15 right there and go all the way back to the, to the back of uh, the last chapter in, in Judges. And I want you to look in the last chapter, 21, and verse number 23. Uh, Judges 21, 23, the last verse in the book of Judges. And look what the Bible says in Judges 21, 25. The Bible says this, in those days there was no king in Israel. Now watch this next statement. Every man, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Uh Uh-oh. Every man did that which was, kind of sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? 
There's a lot of people, they don't, they don't really care what the Bible says or what the preacher says or what God says. They just do what they want to do, okay? And everybody's just doing what they think's right in their own eyes, okay? Does that kind of sound familiar? It does, doesn't it? It's sad, but it's very true in the day that we live in, okay? And, and again, so there was, uh, every man did that which was right in his own, own eyes. So allowing our, our human eyes to dictate our steps is a recipe for disaster, Okay, it's a recipe for disaster, and certainly we're here to help you, not to hurt you. Take your Bibles and turn back to Genesis chapter number 3. Hold on to Judges there if you can, and turn back to Genesis chapter number 3. And we could, t- we could ask Eve, Eve, what about it? What about your eyes, Eve? And in, uh, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6, the Bible says, And when the woman saw... When the woman, when Eve, it's talking about Eve, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes, pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat it and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Wow. Eve's eyes, okay, she saw uh, that forbidden fruit. She saw the tree that she was not supposed to eat of was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes. And instead of obeying God, she did what Eve wanted to do. And Adam did what Adam wanted to do. He willfully sinned and willfully plunged the human race into sin. Take your Bibles and turn to Joshua. Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. We're in Judges, so just one book. Before that, Judges, Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. And look down in verse number 20. The Bible says, And Achan answered Joshua, and there was sin in the camp of Israel, and God had lifted his hand a blessing off of the nation of Israel because of the sin of, of someone there in the camp. And and Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, the glory uh, to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan, this is verse number 20 of Joshua 7, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, watch this now, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done, look at verse 21, when I saw... When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels uh, weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So he said, I saw, I coveted, I took, and I hid. Wow. What happened? He saw something that wasn't his. Are y'all listening to me? He saw something that wasn't his and he took it. It's not good, y'all. It's not good to do that. It's very wrong. When I was a little boy, and I'm ashamed of this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway as an illustration. But when I was a little boy, about 11 years old, my, my mom and dad were in Bible college. My mom and dad went to the old Bible Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, and in school that J. Frank Norris started back in the day. And, and anyway, uh, so I was a little boy in the 60s, and, and my mom and dad, my dad surrendered to preach, and they're in Bible college, and they leave at 7 o'clock in the morning, have to be in class at 7 o'clock. So my older brother Bob, five years older than me and my little sister Debbie, he had to get us up and get us ready for school. And we, you know, he went to uh, junior high school, and my little sister and I, we walked like five blocks to an elementary school. And that was kind of back in the day where it was safe to do all of that, and that wasn't really that big of a deal. But anyway, my brother, I got to running around, to be honest with you. My mom worked, and my dad worked, and they were both in Bible college, and so it was a very busy time in their life. And, uh, you know, honestly, uh, it was a very busy time, okay? They were just kind of going, I mean, we didn't hardly see them. I mean, my dad would work when he got out of seminary. He'd go to work from 3 to 11, and we were already in bed, and I mean, I didn't see him any during the week. He was gone when I'd get up for school, and he was gone. You know, I'd go to bed before he got home from work. And anyway, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but I got to run around with the wrong crowd at school, even in elementary school. There's always going to be a right crowd and a wrong crowd. 
And I got to run around the wrong crowd. And my brother Bob, he was struggling too. Neither one of us were saved at that time. We weren't saved. And so my mom and dad are preparing their lives to serve the Lord, to be a pastor and all of that. And they're in Bible college. And, and, and my, my dad let my brother and I get a paper route. And so I had a paper route. And I threw uh, the Dallas Times Herald. There was the Fort Worth Star Telegram was a big paper. And then there's the Dallas Morning News is a big paper. And then there was the Dallas Times Herald. So those were two big Dallas papers. And they were big on Sundays especially with all the coupons and everything. Well, anyway, you know, I had my own route as 11 years old. And I was, I was excited. And I'd go around and collect the money and throw the papers and all that. And I was kind of wheeling and dealing, you know. But anyway, my brother and I, we began to steal some things. Not good. We would see things that weren't our things and we would covet them and we would take them and we would hide them in our garage and that was wrong. And I'm ashamed of that as a little boy. I'm ashamed of that. That was very wrong. That was sin. That was wicked. Are y'all listening to me? But uh, we stole a lot of things. Back in those days, some of y'all remember, they had Coke bottles, glass Coke bottles. And you, you could turn the, the empty Coke bottles back in for a deposit and get money for the empty Coke bottles. How many of y'all remember that? And those Cokes had a lot of fizz in them. They tasted good. And people would set them out in their garage or out on their carport and, you know, to take them back in. Well, we'd see empty Coke bottles in people's garages and we'd run, I'd run up there. My brother was five years old. He was 16. And so he was driving a 57 Chevrolet. He was driving the getaway car. We were like Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, I was Clyde, of course, and he was Bonnie. But uh, those were outlaws. And he would drive the getaway car, but I would run up there and just grab, you know, a case or a cart or whatever of Coke, empty Coke bottles and run back to the car. It's a wonder we didn't get shot. I mean, it's a miracle. And we were doing that on Saturday night. Real late, it was still dark outside. We'd throw those big Sunday papers. And one thing led to another. My name's J.D., and I'm named after my grandfather's, but at that time, uh, my initials stood for juvenile delinquent. Okay, I was doing some stupid stuff. And... So anyway, these Oasis water jugs, they were big water jugs, and you could get more money for them if they were empty, like a deposit on a water bottle. So I looked at this, you know, we were looking, I saw the water bottle, and we stopped the car, and, and it was the wee hours of the morning. The house was dark, and I ran up there and grabbed that water bo bottle, and I ran back. But over on this side of the street, there was an elderly lady, and she was up. I don't know what she was doing up at that time of the morning, but she saw we was up to no good, and she wrote down the license number to our car. Oh, no. We got home that morning, and we were coming in the back door because we were coming in later than we were supposed to. The back glass sliding door, we was trying to slip in. And, and we was, uh, our, Sunday, our bedroom was a Sunday school class. We started the church in our home. And so it was early on a Sunday morning. We slipped in, and my dad was waiting on us. Man, my dad's old farm boy, you know, fought in Korea, state trooper. He did not play. He whipped us with a razor strap. Ouch. That hurts. A razor strap hurts when you get a whooping. I'm kind of tender back there. If y'all know what I'm talking about. Somebody say amen right there. Amen. Man, my dad would whip us. He would. He loved us, but boy, he would whip us. He'd chasing us while there was hope and chasing, chasing us B times at the right times when we needed it. And he loved us, but, you know, he still whooped us good. Made you not want to do whatever you were doing that was wrong. And so I knew, man, when... My dad was there waiting on us. Man, I saw my life flash before me. I thought, man, we're going to die. He's going to kill us this time. It's going to be bad. And so my dad loaded us up and he took us to the police station in Arlington, Texas. Oh, wow. I was 11 years old. I'd never been to the police station like that. My heart was beating. I was scared. First time offender. This guy's name was Detective Race Pastor. He was kind of about maybe like 5'10", but like maybe like 210 or I mean this guy like had muscles he looked like the incredible Hulk I mean I'm not can he his guy was like bowed up and I mean he had like the vein the veins in his neck when he started interrogating me and asking me all these questions he wanted to know everything that I'd ever stolen in my life when you get scared I told him I said I think I stole some bubble gum when I was in my baby bed I mean, man, I started like dreaming up things. I got an imagination. I was like, I was imagining things that I might have stolen. I mean, I was scared. And I thought, man, my brother's on his own. I don't care what he tells him. I'm just telling him everything I know. And man, I did. I was crying and I spilt the beans and told him everything that I'd ever stolen. And, you know, he raked us over the coals and, and, and then he turned us back to my dad. And I was really hoping they would just put us in jail. You know, I didn't want to go home with my dad because I knew what was going to happen when we got home. Amen. If y'all know what I'm talking about. And so we got home, and, and uh, you know, we got home to the house, and, 
we walked in the house, and I, I knew we were going to get a whipping. And, and my mama was sitting there in the house. My mama was sitting there in the house, and my mama was crying. She, oh, she, was, she just thought we were good boys. You know, they're in Bible college. They're preparing their lives to serve the Lord. And my mom just, she thought we were good boys. She just had no idea. She was totally devastated. I'd seen my mom cry at funerals and things like that. But this was just, I mean, this was different. We just literally broke her heart. Are y'all with me? I mean, she was just sobbing uncontrollably. And I'm telling you, my little 11-year-old mind, I did not like, it hurt me that, that I had hurt my mama. And I didn't like to see my mama hurting because of me. So it was messing with me in my heart. And my dad said this. He said, boys, he said, You're, you've broken your mother's heart. But he said, the Bible says, if a man can't rule his own house well, then he can't be a preacher. And if you guys don't get your act together, I'm not going to be able to do what God has called me to do. And, you know, I mean, I thought, wow, you know, I hurt my mom, I hurt my dad. He's not going to be able to be a preacher no more because of me. And, I mean, I was processing all that. And, you know, I really, I just kind of, it was because of things. Listen to me now. It was because I saw things and I coveted things and I took things that were not mine. And that was wrong. It's wrong. It's still wrong, by the way. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. You know, we see things and we want it. And it's just because it's just not our stuff. That's wrong. And I, I was just, man, I was, I was overwhelmed. I knew we was going to get a whipping, but I was just, I was sorry because I couldn't take my mama. So I went over to my mama. And Miss Tammy, I knelt down by my mama, my mama. And I said, Mama, I'm sorry. And she was crying and I was crying. And my mama hugged me. She hugged me. She didn't push me away and say, get out of here. You're not my little boy no more. My mama's not like that. No, she saw that I was... Sorry that I was repentant of my sins and she loved me and she forgave me. And you know what? I'm glad that God, the Bible says about the Lord, a broken and a contrite heart, the Lord will not despise. When we get down on our knees and we say, God, I'm sorry. I, I, I coveted that. God, I'm sorry. I, look, I, I saw that. I coveted that. I took that. I hid that. I stole that. Lord, I'm wrong. That's, I was wrong. Lord, I'm sorry. And when God sees a broken and contrite heart, the Lord will not despise you. He'll not push you away either. I'm glad it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And your revival is a, beginning, a, a new beginning of obedience to God. And like Pastor said, you know, we can't just be, you know, like acting like, you know, when we got sin in our lives, we, we can't just sweep it under the rug and, and act like it's no big deal and measure ourselves by other people that are worse than we are. No, they're not the measuring stick. No, Jesus is the measuring stick. He's the one. He's the righteous one. He's the holy one. And He told us to be ye holy, for I am holy. And it does matter how we live as God's children. And God wants us to live righteous and holy lives. And when we get saved, we give Him all of our sins and He gives us His righteousness. The just for the unjust that He might bring us to God. It's called the doctrine of imputation, okay? We give Him all of our sins and He gives us His righteousness. And when God the Father looks at us, He doesn't see us like we really are. He sees us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we're covered, we're under the blood. What a blessing, amen, an atonement for our sins, a covering for our sins. Wow, what a blessing. And I'm glad I'm saved tonight, and I'm glad you're saved tonight. But we have to be careful. Oh, be careful. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Wow. Wow. Wow, Achan saw, he coveted, he took, he hid. You remember the story in 1 Samuel 11, verses 1 and following. You remember the story about King David? And King David, it was a time when kings went forth to battle, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. He wasn't where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. He was supposed to be leading the troops out into battle, but he tarried still in Jerusalem. You remember that? And in an even tide, he looked out his window and he saw Bathsheba over there bathing on the hay. He saw, he saw Bathsheba. 
He saw something he shouldn't see because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. A lot of times, man, kids skip school. Kids, you know, people do things they're not where they're supposed to be, and they get in trouble. Are y'all are listening to me? They get in trouble because of something they see. Wow, we've had some unbelievable situations in our ministry. I remember when we first started our church, Pastor, we had a family that moved to our area. And they had three little boys. Man, all the little boys had little shirts and ties on. They are just a, a sharp little family. They had gotten saved down in Corpus Christi, Texas. And they moved to Monroe, Louisiana. And then from Monroe, they came to our little town in El Dorado. And we were excited and they came to our church on our first anniversary that Sunday. They came and visited our church, and then they started coming. Well, he became our, one of our ch- child, worked with children's ministries and, and all of that and, and had influence over my children when they were little. And I was out of town preaching. And they'd been with us for a few years, and I got a call. And it was my brother, who's our associate pastor, Brother Bob. And he said, uh, he said Brother George is, 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 is gone, and Miss Donna's here, and... She's all upset, and, and he's left her. I, was, I could not believe it. You know what? He saw, he saw a woman down in Louisiana. He saw a woman, and he, he, you know, he, he, he coveted, and he took that woman. He, he went with that woman instead of with his wife and his three little boys. It messed his little boys up. They were good little boys. They loved the Lord, and it just messed their lives up because they loved their daddy, and they didn't understand. I'm just telling you, listen to me. You better be careful what you look at. Pornography and things like that and sneaking around and looking at things with your eyes. God's children, we have no business looking at. We better be careful. Little eyes, what we see. Well, the Father up above is looking down in love. And King David, I'm telling you, man, he made a mess of things. With Bathsheba, man, he brought Uriah the Hittite, her husband, in from the... You know, uh, and, and, and got, tried to get him drunk, tried to get him to sleep with his wife to cover his tracks, and then he sent him out with his own death, you know, uh, papers there and to the forefront. They put him in the forefront of the hottest battle where valiant men were known to fight. And Uriah the Hittite died. David had him killed. Well, the sword never left David's house. It's so sad. And you study that, and I think it's in, 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 in verse chapter 12 there. And David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Oh, yeah. And the Lord took that little, little illegitimate baby home early. Remember that? All that was the effects of David's sin because he saw something and he coveted it and he took it and it wasn't his to take. It belonged to another man, to Uriah, his wife. Wow. I'm just saying, y'all, it's serious business. What about Lot's wife? The Lord said, don't look back. And you know what Lot's wife did? She did exactly what God said not to do. The angel Lord said, don't look back. Don't look back. It's pretty easy to understand. Go this way, don't look back. You know what she did? She looked back. Why? She wanted to see. The city was burning, but she wanted to see. And she became a pillar of salt. You know, I, with my background with cows and all, I can see cows coming by and just licking that, that pillar of salt. She became a salt block. The cows walking by and licking her. I thought, wow, that is crazy. Wow. We could ask Solomon, the wisest man apart from the Lord Jesus Christ who ever lived. Hey, he, he, you know, he had all those wives. You know what they did? They turned his heart away from the Lord. He saw all those women. Those women turned his heart away from the Lord. And I'm telling you, if David was a man after God's own heart, he had eye trouble, and Samson's the strongest man that ever lived, and he had eye trouble, and and again, uh, uh, Solomon was the wisest man, and he had eye trouble. Where does that leave us, man? We better be careful. We better be careful, little eyes, what we see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Now turn to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, and... Samson never, he never seems to learn the lesson. He travels deeper, deeper into Philistine territory and to a city called Gaza. And he's not just strolling down the path now to the next village. Now he's traveling from north to south to a city in the distant south. It's a distance of nearly 40 miles. Wow, I mean, he's going a long ways into enemy territory. Now look in Judges chapter 16, verse number 1. And the Bible says this, Then went Samson to Gaza... 
and saw, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. He saw there an harlot. You see that again? He saw, he saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. There's no hiding now or pretending. Samson is not now. He's not just following his eyes. Uh, what he sees, you know, uh, he he will get. But uh, again. If you look on down at verse number 4, And it came to pass afterwards that he loved a woman in the valley of Zorik, whose name was Delilah. So now the man who is living to satisfy the cravings of his eyes is now controlled by his lust. Are, are you all listening to me? He, is, he's, he's, he started out just you know, his eyes, now he's controlled by his lust. And again... There's no reference in, in verse 4 to what he sees. He's just now, he's not, he's not wrestling with sin. Now he's controlled by sin. He's out of control because he just lets his eyes, I mean, he can't even, he's not even trying to stop himself now. And he tells Delilah soon, he tells Delilah the secret of his strength and she delivers him to the Philistines and, and you know the rest of the story. Now look what happens in Judges 16 21 when they, the Philistines uh, catch Samson. But look at verse number 21. Judges 16, 21. But the Philistines took him, took Samson. Look what they did. And put out his eyes. And put out his what? His eyes. The enemy caught him and they put out his eyes. Wow. This was a common practice uh, when an enemy would capture someone in those days. And so the man who was controlled by his eyes, who was governed by his eyes, is now a blind man. Wow, that's unbelievable, isn't it? He's now a blind man. And the man who allowed his eyes to rule his life and, and, and is now a man whose eyes have been gouged out. That's sad, isn't it? What a sad story. Now, the very first words that Samson speaks in the Bible is, I have seen a woman. And Samson never learns. He never learns now. Please listen to me. He never learns to control his eyes. He never learns to control what he sees. Now, we're going to compare for just a moment here uh, Samson with the man in the, in, in, uh, of God in the Bible called Job. Take your Bibles and turn to Job uh, chapter number 31 very quickly. We're almost done. I know we got school tonight. I want to get the kids in bed at a decent hour and all that good stuff. Job chapter 31. Job chapter 31. And look down at verse number, well look at verse number 1. Look what Job said. Job said this, he said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a mate? So Job realizes that the power of his eyes, the power of the eyes, and he makes a deal, Job makes a deal between himself, his eyes, and his God. That's very wise. He makes a deal uh, with himself, his eyes, and his God. Okay, the world says it doesn't hurt to look. You know, I was watching at the airport and I was watching men. And I'm a man, but I was watching men watch women. And y'all, it's out of control. It's out of control. Men following women who are not dressed right with their eyes. Ladies, that's why it's important even as God's, God's children as ladies that you dress modestly. That you, you know, I mean, wow, you don't want men looking at you in a way that's not appropriate, that's not right. Are y'all with me? And, and, and girls, have, they need to hear this because if they don't hear preaching and teaching on it, then they grow up thinking it's no big deal. No, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And you might be kind of innocent, how, but listen, be careful how you dress because you can be try, you know, attracting uh, boys' eyes and men's eyes as they get older and it's not right. And Job realizes this power, and so he makes a deal with him, between himself, his eyes, and his God. And I don't care what the world says. The world says it doesn't hurt to look, but Job and Samson, they don't agree on this deal. I mean, Samson's on one side and Job's on the other side. And remember James 1.15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Here's how it goes. A look, just a look, leads to lust. A look leads to lust. Lust leads to curiosity. Lust leads to curiosity. A look leads to lust. Lust leads to curiosity. Curiosity leads to actions. Curiosity leads to actions and actions lead to a lifestyle. 
You know, people see something and they want something. That's the way David was. He, he saw Bathsheba and he was curious. And, and then he sent for her and he took her. You know, one thing led to another, if you know what I'm talking about. And so that's exactly a look leads to lust. Lust leads to curiosity. Curiosity leads to actions. And action, actions lead to a lifestyle. And for Samson, it all ends in death. It's really sad. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Let me give you my closing illustration. Several years ago, I had a friend of mine who lived in another city. He wasn't in my church, but he was a friend of mine, a businessman, Christian businessman. He calls me one day, and, and I knew his son, and he said, uh, Brother Weedo, I, my, my son's having problems. And I knew his son, knew his son by name, and, and, and uh, he said he's gotten hooked on pornography. He was 17 years old, got hooked on pornography. A Christian boy, a good boy. But he got hooked on pornography. And I listened for a little bit, and then I thought, you know, this is pretty heavy stuff. And I said, I said, I'll tell you all what, let's call my preacher friend. I call my preacher friend in Fort Dodge, Iowa, uh, Pastor Marvin Smith. And I said, Brother Smith, I said, this is a businessman, Christian businessman, friend of mine. He's got his 17-year-old son with him. And I said, you know, he's gotten hooked on pornography, and he, he wants victory. He wants to get off of it. Could you help him? And Brother Smith, again, my friend, my preacher friend, he began to ask this boy, he said, uh, son, he said, uh, he said, uh, you love the Lord? And he said, yes, sir, I love the Lord. And he said, well, that's good. And, and he, you know, he asked him some questions, you know. And he said, you, you got problems with pornography? Yes, sir. And he said, are you wanting victory? You really want victory? You're serious about this. You want victory? And he said, yes, sir, I do. And, and so anyway, then my preacher friend talked to him, you know, and, and, and all of that. He got onto the dad, told the dad, and I, sir, if you're going to help your son, you're going to have to take the Internet out of your house. You're not going to be able to allow your son to have access to these dirty pictures and this pornography stuff. And so he talked to this boy, you know, and I'm in Arkansas in my car, and, and, you know, and I'm in a totally different place. I'm not with the, the 17-year-old boy and his dad, so it's a three-way call. And he said, he said to this boy, he said, son, he said, uh, I want you to picture a long hallway. And he said, can you picture a long hallway in your mind? And he said, yes, sir, I picture it. And he said, down at the end of the hallway, there's a door. And he said, son, I want you to start walking toward that door. And he said, are, are, do you see the door? He said, yes, sir, in his mind. And I was seeing it in my mind. And, and he said, I want you to start walking toward the door. And in my mind, I was walking down this hallway toward this door. And he said, son, he said, behind the door at the end of the hallway, behind this door are all the pictures, all the filth, all the vile, all the pornography, all the, 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 the wicked things that you've been looking at. And son, uh, behind, that's what's behind that door. And he said, son, I'm going to give you a key, and I want you to lock that door. And he said, you got the key? And in my mind, I was going through it, and, 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 and he said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, lock that door. And he locked the door. And he said, you got it locked? And he said, yes, sir. And he said, now, by locking that door, we're going to promise God that you're never going to open that door again. And he said, son, here's what I want you to do now. He said, I want you to take the key to that door and I want you to place it in the nail-pierced hand of Jesus Christ. And he said, the only way that you will open that door again is you're going to have to pry the key to that door out of the nail-pierced hand of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, I thought, wow, man, I was getting goosebumps on top of my goosebumps. I mean, it's like the Spirit of the Lord was talking to me through that. You know, I mean, I just thought, wow, that is an unbelievable illustration. And I'm saying to you tonight, you know, we can get in over our head if we're not careful by the things that we look at. And it can start with even little children. And that's why that song is so powerful, even though it's a little kid's song. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful. Little eyes, what you see. And I think in a revival meeting, it would be a good time to make a covenant with our eyes like Job did. And say, God, I want you to, to protect my eyes, Lord. My eyes are your eyes, and I love you, Lord. And I, I want to make a covenant with you that I'm not going to look upon a maid. I'm not going to use my eyes to look at things that I shouldn't look at. That would be a good commitment to make in a revival meeting. And I'm telling you, man, sin is everywhere. And the devil certainly attacks through the eye gate and the ear gate. The things that we look at and the things we listen to, those are very powerful tools that Satan will use. And the Bible says 
In 2 Corinthians it says casting down, casting down imaginations. And if we have those thoughts and things in our head and in our hearts, we need to give them to Jesus and let Him help us get them out of our minds. Are you all with me on that? Get that junk out of our minds. The washing of the water of the Word of God washes and cleanses our mind out. That's why we need the devil preached out of us so we'll be, have clean hands and clean hearts. Before the, That's why we need revival. That's why you need revival and I need revival. And I think it'd be good to get on our knees and pray and say, Lord, help me. Lord, please help my eyes. I don't want to set no wicked thing before my eyes. Lord, I don't want to look at things that are not right no more. Please help me, Lord. I want to make a covenant with my eyes of this revival. Moving forward, not going to look at anything that's not going to be pleasing to you. Let's bow our heads tonight.